year, Thanksgiving, we know that all of our blessings come from you, and we just praise you and thank you for the hope we have in Christ and all the blessings you provide for us. Lord, as we come together together to prayer this morning, we'd like to thank you and ask for encouragement for those who were baptized this morning. Bless them, we pray, with your Holy Spirit, and uh, pray that each one of us would have words of encouragement and support for them as they begin their walk with you. Lord, we uh, do think of all the things happening around the world. We have wars and rumors of wars in Russia and uh, Ukraine, Israel, all these places, Palestine. We just pray that your hand would be on bringing peace to those situations. And uh, Lord, we just ask that you would give us an attitude of gratitude, that we would be a blessing to others. We pray that you would be with each one of us especially in this time of year that we get together with family and friends. Give us wisdom, discernment, discretion, boldness in your Holy Spirit in sharing our faith. And Lord, we just ask you to be with Pastor Doug as he brings us the word this morning and uh, talks to us about prayer. Lord, may we be lifted up into your presence. I pray your Holy Spirit would be poured out on each one of us and that we would be faithful in doing your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, uh, we witnessed some beautiful baptisms this morning, and now to make this official, we'd entertain a motion that we welcome these individuals into the Granite Bay Hilltop Church family. Do we have such a motion? Do we have a second? All in favor say amen. 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 God bless you. We have some gifts for them. And I know the, the kids are traveling back to school in Michigan uh, soon, and, but they'll be back again with us before Christmas. Praise God. Welcome. I know that um, during the Thanksgiving holiday, we always have a little uh, mix-up, meaning that we've got some of our folks are gone with families and some of you visiting are here visiting families, and so we have a lot of new people Welcome. We're glad that uh, you're able to visit with us. I'm just curious, is anyone here visiting maybe for the first time today? Oh, praise the Lord. Look around you. Wonderful. Praise God. We hope that uh, you only meet the friendly people here today. <laughs> no, we got a good group. And I want to welcome those. We always have a, an even bigger family that's watching online or on television. And we welcome you always. If you're in the Sacramento, Granite Bay area, Come, come visit us. We, we'd love to uh, meet you and, and uh, worship together. You know, I've been praying about what to talk about, and I was convicted to talk about prayer. Um, Karen and I have been going through a book, it's probably been two years, uh, in our Sabbath worship. We do something special for worship Friday night, and sometimes also for Vespers Saturday night. And we've been reading through a book on prayer by E.M. Bounds. It is a, a very powerful book. It, it's so powerful, so heavy, we just read maybe two or three pages for our worship. But it's all on all the different aspects of prayer. I had no idea uh, how long and how much you could say about prayer that is not said, and all of it is new and fresh and powerful. And, uh, you know, I'm not trying to sell a book, because Amazing Facts doesn't sell this, but I recommend um, if you want to have a revival in your prayer life, you read a book like this and I think it will encourage you. And I kept telling Karen every time we'd, we'd read another section, I said, boy, we need to talk about prayer more often because we just don't do it enough. I think we might all agree that the church could be doing much more in the world today than it is doing. That God's will is not being done right now on earth as it is in heaven. And that's not because God is limited in his power. It's because the church is limited in its praying. God is able to do and wanting to do, to do exceedingly abundantly above more than we can think, but we need to ask and pray. And we're just not praying the way we should. I remember reading in the book of Acts when the apostles got busy settling disputes 
about who was getting some of the food distribution that eventually they came to their senses. They said, you know, we need to ordain some deacons to take care of that because it's not right that we leave the word of God, but we will give ourselves to the word and to prayer. They, they said, we need to make sure and carve out enough time for prayer, communion with God. There's a battle going on between good and evil all around you in this world. A lot of things that God wants to do, he can't do because we don't ask. And so I'd like to talk about prayer. And uh, in your bulletin, it, it doesn't say this is part one. It may be part one. It's kind of like when you go to the hospital and the doctor says you're expecting and you're excited and you come back. And then he tells you next time, he took a picture and you're actually expecting two. So this may turn out that way. We'll see how it goes. But I want to talk about 10 keys to answered prayer. And this is certainly not exhaustive because there is so much more that I could say about this subject. I remember a few years ago, I was at a church meeting in uh, Maryland, and all of our church leaders got together, and you know, they put us up in a hotel across, across the street from the conference office, and uh, I woke up early in the morning. This is several years ago. Back then, it's before the internet was ubiquitous. How many of you get your news on the internet? Come on. How many of you never raise your hand when the pastor asks a question? <laughs> um, but they, this hotel used to put a newspaper at every door in the morning. It was kind of nice. They would just put, you know, a few pages of USA Today at the paper. And, and so I opened my door. It was winter time, and I'm wearing a T-shirt and long underwear. And I opened the door, and I looked up and down the hall, and there's newspapers by everyone's door, but mine, someone had nipped my paper. But I saw, well, I'll get someone else's paper because no one gets reads them all. There's always papers left over. They got them in the lobby, but I wasn't really fit to go to the lobby right then. So I thought, well, I'll just go across, I'll grab one of those papers. And, and uh, you know, hotel doors are made to shut automatically. <laughs> and so I knew that, you know, but I thought I'm fast. And so I gave it a little bump with my rear end to push the door open, and I went across the hall, reached down to grab the paper, come back, and I missed it. I had to go back again to grab it, and the door shut. And there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> because I am standing, this is a true story, I am standing in the hall surrounded by a hotel full of pastors, and I'm wearing red long underwear, <laughs> I'm barefoot and a t-shirt, and I have no key. I thought I'd get back in, you know. And I'm sitting there considering my options. <laughs> I've got no phone. <laughs> and um, I finally thought, well, I'm just going to have to go to the lobby like this because <laughs> i got to get a key to get in my room. I thought, well, I'd call the front desk, but I don't have a phone. And so I walk over to the elevator. And I know, you know, humiliation is great for the soul. And so I'm standing there at the elevator, and the elevator door opens, and there is the conference president. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks at me, and he says something like, so we're we going casual today, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you his name. Nice guy. I said, I got locked out of my room. He said, no, really? <laughs> I said, can you go to the front desk and get a key for me? And so he went down, and they said they could not give him the key to my room, but they would send somebody up. And so there was one more little phase of humiliation. But, um, boy, it makes a big difference when you got a key. <laughs> and a lot of people wonder why prayer doesn't seem to work, and they don't understand some of the basics of prayer. Now, again, I'm not going to talk about everything you might know about prayer, but I will share with you what I see as some of the, the elementary basics. And I'll tell you in advance where we're going, so you can track along. You can watch your watch and wonder about the beans in the casserole. We're going to talk about the consistency of prayer, to pray submissively, to pray specifically, to pray faithfully, earnestly, patiently, obediently, proactively, collectively, and officially. And you may want to take some pictures. For each of these, I will have at least one scripture. And um, first thing is, if you want to make it real simple, pray like Jesus. 
Uh, every one of the things I just mentioned, all the key aspects of prayer, Jesus incorporated these things in his praying. The Bible tells us that um, in Luke chapter 9, 29, at one point Jesus is up on this mount of transfiguration and he's praying. And as he's praying, it says his face was altered. Now, today when you say, I saw somebody and their face was altered, it could mean many things. But when it says Jesus' face was altered, he began to shine. It's like where it says in the book of Acts chapter 6 that when Stephen was being tried before he was martyred, it says they looked upon him and his face was like the face of an angel. When Moses came off the mountain talking to God, it says he had to veil his face because they couldn't even look at him because it was shining. And the face of Jesus was shining when he prayed. And another time, Luke 1, I'm sorry, Luke 11, verse 1, it came to pass as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, that's really fascinating when you think about it because these are all Jewish boys. Uh, they grew up going to synagogue. Every Sabbath they went to synagogue. They were all taught to read. Even David knew how to read and write way back then. I mean, they, so they knew how to read. They prayed in the synagogue. You think, well, they grew up praying. But when they saw Jesus come from prayer, his face was shining. They thought, how come we don't have that experience? There's something wrong with our praying and the praying of the priests and the Pharisees, and we don't see them looking like that when they come from talking with God. And then they said, Jesus, teach us to pray. You know what that means? Prayer can be taught. That means that if you have not been taught, it may be you don't know how. And then they go on, they said, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. Meaning not only did Jesus teach prayer, but John taught prayer. And I think this is probably one of the big weaknesses in the church is that people are never taught how to pray. And, you know, some people think, well, you know, some folks have the gift of prayer and they're prayer warriors and other people have other gifts and I'm just not just me. And, oh, friends, I never hear anyone grow up and say, well, some people have the gift of driving and it's not me and I'll let other people drive. And um, All of us learn to drive because it's so important to get around. Amen? Uh, there's a few exceptions of people that don't learn to drive. But... Praying is a lot more important to the Christian life than driving is to transportation. It is foundational, and we have to learn how to pray. And with anything that you learned, you know, you can practice. That means you may not be great the first time. And so we're going to talk about some things that may help us learn how to pray. All right, getting to number one of the keys. Step number one, pray consistently. It's something you should do all the time. It's like breathing. It's not something you do just every now and then. It should be a way of life. The most important thing about prayer is to pray. People talk about it and they sing about it and they just don't do it. Or they don't do it very much. We need to pray consistently. Daniel, morning, evening, and at noon. Well, actually, I was quoting Psalm 55, 17. Daniel prayed three times a day. David said, morning, evening, and at noon I'll pray. Prayer should be a regular part of our life. In fact, Paul said, pray without ceasing, one of the shortest verses in the Bible. That means we should be walking with God, talking with God, not to mention the official formal times of prayer. We need to ask. That's what it means to pray consistently. John 16, 24, Jesus said, until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, he says it twice, ask, ask that your joy, your what? That your joy may be full. Who wants full joy? It says, pray more. If you learn to pray, you'll have more joy. I remember my mother told me I had to take guitar lessons. And I was miserable. I think I lasted two weeks. The teacher was telling me to do things with my fingers I'm sure that God did not intend for them to do. And it hurt and uh, it wasn't working, and I complained, and, but I did learn three chords in two weeks. I put down the guitar, didn't pick up again for 10 years. I picked it up, I still remembered those three chords, I started adding to it and learning more. I get so much personal joy now, I wish I had stuck with it longer. 
just the little bit that I learned has brought so much joy to my life over the years. And prayer can feel like work at first. But if you learn to do it, it'll bring you joy, friends. Amen? James 4.2, yet you do not have because you do not ask. I remember hearing a parable. I may have shared this before, but I've been here a long time, so you've probably heard everything I know. This angel was taking a tour on their first trip through heaven, and he was shocked because he saw rows and rows of warehouses that looked like great big golden Amazon buildings. And he seemed surprised by that. He thought, this, these can't be mansions. Who lives there? Oh, no, they're not mansions. They're warehouses. Warehouses in heaven. What on earth do you do with warehouses in heaven? And the angel said, well, actually, these are filled to the top with prayers we wanted to answer that people never asked. There's so much more that God wants to do for us that he doesn't do because we don't ask. There are miracles that he wants to perform that he doesn't perform because we don't give him a chance. So not only should you pray, but if you're going to ask, ask big. Now, when, you, um, when you're thinking about prayer, the best time for prayer is not found, it's made. You don't just collide with a good time for prayer. You schedule it. Uh, people don't forget to eat very often. Um, you should schedule time for prayer and make it a point. And then when you pray, don't be afraid to pray big things. Don't let your prayers be mundane. You can be specific, but ask for big things. The reason you have Moses in the Bible is because he prayed big prayers. He prayed and waters turned to blood and the oceans parted and fire came down from heaven and Joshua prayed and the sun stood still. I mean, you think God might look down and say, hey, Joshua, come on now, let's not get carried away. Sun stands still. But he prayed in faith and there was a need for that answer that day. Elisha prays and miracles happen and axe head floats and a leper is healed and Elijah prays and it rains and again fire comes down from heaven. Solomon prays and he gets supernatural wisdom. Don't be afraid to ask big things of God. Uh, John Newton, who wrote the song Amazing Grace, he used to like to tell the story about Alexander the Great that um, one day Alexander had asked for this man's wife in marriage and she was a Persian girl and, and he asked the father and the father said yes but he asked for an exorbitant sum as a dowry and Alexander said agreed go talk to the treasurer so the man went to the treasurer and the treasurer came hopping mad stomping back to Alexander saying did you hear what this rascal is asking for as a dowry so that's a fantastic sum She's not worth nearly that much. And Alexander said, give it to him. I like the guy. He honors me. He thinks that I'm great, rich, and generous. Now, if Alexander would think that, because someone asked big, who's bigger, God or Alexander the Great? And so you're never going to surprise the Lord. He wants to answer your prayers in things big and small. So ask him. I remember a few years ago, uh, I was in the Philippines. We were videotaping a, an evangelistic series there, and our media crew was there. And we, we taped some amazing facts. Some of you maybe saw. We did, taped an amazing fact about gypneys. Uh, and uh, in the process of that, at the end of the day, one of the media guys told me, he said, uh, I got bad news, Doug. He said, we left one of our cameras in the jipney, and they drove off. There are 20 plus million people in Manila, and the jipney drivers are not rich. And this is like an eight, ten thousand dollar camera, and what really made it worse is all the footage we had taped so far was on this camera. And this young man, he just felt awful. And um, I said, well, let's pray about it. And so we prayed, and I said, Lord, we pray that that driver, when he finds the camera, will be convicted to bring it back. Now, the likelihood of that was pretty small um, because these folks don't have a lot of money, and the camera like that could help him retire. 
And so I said, let's pray. And in our prayer, I said, Lord, I believe you're going to answer this prayer. And while I'm praying, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to just pray that it'll come back. And I said, Lord, I pray it comes back tonight in time for the meeting. And um, I thought, wow, I'm being really bold now. But in my mind, I'm thinking, Lord, I'm going to ask for something big because I want the young man's faith to be strengthened. So answer it for his sake. That night he came up to me and he said, did you hear? He said the man came home and he was showing his father that uh, they had a new camera they could sell and make all this money. And the father said that came from that Christian group that's meeting at the Akata Astrodome. He says, you're not going to be blessed if you keep that. You need to take it back. And he argued with his father and his father said, you need to take it back. And the father called and said, that we've got your camera. How do, where do we bring it? And the camera came back and what do you think that did for the faith of the media team. And so pray big prayers. God, he wants to answer your prayers. I can't tell you how many times that God has worked miracles. Now, we need to make a, a book because I think sometimes I forget the miracles. Point number two, pray submissively. Pray submissively. What do I mean by that? When you pray, submit every prayer to God's will. Ultimately, you want to pray according to God's will. Matthew 6, verse 10 in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, not my will. Jesus even submitted his will to the will of the Father. For those that don't think that Jesus and the Father are separate, they had separate wills. Amen? They were two separate beings. Thy will be done, not my will. So whatever your, pr your prayers are, um, make sure that you're praying in accordance with His will. Now, God's will is best revealed through His Word. So you want your prayers to be in accordance with the Word. Amen? And so, uh, it's like James 4, 3. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. You're asking for the wrong thing that you might consume it on your pleasures. Now, Balaam, his prayer was that he could go and curse Israel so he could get the reward. Well, that was not God's will. And so it backfired on him. And be careful about praying for something that you know is not God's will because God may answer your prayer and it won't end well. You know, one time the children of Israel, Numbers chapter 14, they were complaining. It says in verse 2, they complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation of them said, if only, this is kind of a prayer, if only we had died in the land of Egypt or if only we had died in this wilderness. Well, God had, this is after they got the Ten Commandments and all these miracles, and God said, enough is enough. I'm going to answer that prayer. You're not going to make it to the promised land. You will die in the wilderness. Your children will enter the promised land. Be careful what you ask for. Always say, Lord, if it's your will. Some people pray and pray and pray and say, I've got to marry this person, Lord. I've got to, they get them, and then they say, oh, Lord, help me out of this. <laughs> Always say, if it's your will. Amen? Or I've got to have this job. If I could only have this job, then they get the job and they're miserable. And they realize they're not where God wants them to be. So submit your prayers to the will of God. James and John came to Jesus and said, Lord, we want to sit on your right hand and your left hand when you enter the kingdom. And Jesus said, do you know what you're asking for? Sometimes we don't know what we're asking for. Oh, we know, Lord. We want position A and B on the right and the left by your throne. Top dogs. And he said, are you able to be baptized with my baptism and drink of my cup? Oh, yeah, sure. Yep, absolutely. No problem. He said, okay, you will be baptized with my baptism. But to sit on the right and left is not mine to give, but the Father's. And they didn't know what they were asking for. When they said, your baptism, drink your cup, they didn't realize that's a cup of suffering and a baptism of suffering. And so when we think we want the highest position, that's totally out of character. Jesus said, he that would be great among you, he should be servant of all. And it took them a while to learn that lesson. Just know, whenever you submit your prayers to God's will, it's always going to be better for you. You don't feel like you need to struggle with that fact about submitting your prayers to His will because His will, in the long run, when you get to heaven, you can always see His will was better than your will. Amen? Mark 10, 38, He said, You don't know what you're asking. So, point number three in your prayers, pray specifically. Um, you know, sometimes when you pray, we just pray and say, well, it's time for prayer. We don't really ask for anything specific. And if you ask a person an hour later, say, what did you pray? I prayed. What did you pray for? 
well, my typical thank you for this and that, give me this and that. I mean, when you pray, be specific. How are you going to know if the answer comes if you don't ask for anything specific? And part of praying specifically is claiming his promises. The Bible tells us his word is full of promises. 2 Peter 1 verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these we might become partakers of the divine nature. You know, what that right there is the should be the core of every prayer, that we might be partakers of the divine nature made in the image of God. That image has been damaged by sin. We want to be restored to the image of God. A Christian is a follower of Christ. We want to be like our master. Through the promises of God, we become like him. And so knowing the promises of God, and there, there are promises for almost every occasion. Amazing Facts also has a book on the Bible promises. You can find lists of hundreds online, promises. You'll search for me and you find me when you search with all your heart. And, and uh, you, your bread and your water will be sure. And I remember one time I was uh, hitchhiking through Southern California with a girlfriend. Sorry, Karen, it wasn't you. She already knows this story. And, uh, but I just started to read the Bible and we got stuck in this all-night restaurant waiting for the sun to come up because it wasn't a safe place to hitchhike at night. And just, um, just drinking coffee and reading the Bible because we didn't have any money. But I was reading in the Bible where it said, if you being evil give good gifts to your children, if your son wants a loaf of bread, will you give him a stone? And if he asks for uh, a fish, will you give him a serpent? I think a serpent is the egg. A anyway, and so I said, it says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give to those that ask? I was really hungry, and I thought, well, I'm going to try this. So I went to the restaurant, restroom. I knelt down and prayed and said, Lord, we have no money. I can't really panhandle. There's nobody there. There's just like five of us in the restaurant. And I said, uh, I'd sure like something to eat. And you promised here, if you're hungry, you'll feed us. So I don't know how you're going to work that out, Lord, but we could show you some money. See, I was thinking that someone was going to hand us some money. So I walked out, and I got back to the table. My girlfriend was smiling. I said, why are you smiling? She said, while you were in the bathroom, the waitress came up and said, what would you like to order to eat? And I told her, we don't want anything to eat. She said, I'm buying your dinner tonight. What do you want? Anything on the menu. Boy, we had a really good dinner. <laughs> I still remember. I ordered a patty milk. <laughs> I was a, not a vegetarian back then. <laughs> anyway, but what do you think that did for my faith? I come out of the bathroom. I'm saying, Lord, you said you'd feed your hungry. I claimed his promise. I went out food in the middle of the night. The wait How many of you go and the waitress offers to buy your food? God will open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings. He wants to answer our prayers. So be specific. You know, of course, always ask for the most important things in your prayer. You want to have love, forgiveness, holiness. Sometimes instead of praying that God would deliver us from sin, and that should be a priority, we pray he will make us comfortable while we keep on sinning. We pray for all the creature comforts, but we don't pray for victory. But at the heart of every prayer, it should be, Lord, Save me from sin. And then the other, you know, the daily bread and the clothing and the things that he provides for. You pray specifically, pray submissively, and pray faithfully. When you pray, pray with faith. Pray believing. Amen? You know what Jesus said about that? Matthew chapter 21, verse 22. Whatsoever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Well, that sounds like carte blanche. If we're meeting the other criteria in the keys of prayer and we have faith, he says, I'm going to answer your prayer in the affirmative. You'll receive whatever you need. If you're praying according to God's will and you're following the other criteria, you'll receive it. Believe. You know, there was this centurion and his servant was sick and he sent messengers to Jesus saying, could you please heal my servant? And Jesus and the apostles made their way towards his house. The centurion heard that Jesus was coming. And he said, no, 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 you don't need to come. 
said, I'm a man of authority. I tell one, do this, he does it, give another order, they obey. He says, just simply speak the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus stopped and his mouth fell open. He said, I have not seen such faith in all of Israel. And that man's servant was healed. He believed Jesus didn't even need to go, just speak the word. And did God honor his faith? Now, he doesn't want us to have presumptuous faith, but he wants us to believe. Pray big prayers. John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. James chapter 1, verse 6, he says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. Believe he's going to answer your prayers. Some of you, uh, even just last night, Karen was listening to a testimony tape of George Mueller, story of his life. And I remember one story, George Mueller was a, this great missionary, started orphanages in uh, Bristol, England, and fed all these kids by faith for years, hundreds of kids, and uh, just had incredible faith. And he wasn't a trained minister, but um, he was sailing across the Atlantic up near New England at one point to make a speaking appointment and uh, they were stuck in a fog bank and the ship was just going along very slowly and Mueller went to the captain he said captain he says can we speed up at all he says uh, the rate we're going I'm gonna miss my appointment I've never missed an appointment and they're gonna be waiting for me and and captain says we can't go anywhere pastor for this fog is is uh, blocking our progress he said well let's go pray that God will lift the fog and the captain said, oh, all right, you know, he clearly wasn't too excited, so they went into the captain's uh, chambers and they knelt down and George Mueller prayed and said, Lord, I'm your servant, you've given me this appointment, the people are there, they want to hear the word, I believe you want me to be there, but this fog's in the way, please make the fog go away. And then the captain started to pray and uh, Mueller put his hand on his shoulder, he said, Captain, you don't need to pray. He said, for one thing, you don't believe, you don't believe the fog's going to be lifted, he says, I believe it already has. And they went out of the captain's quarters and the fog was completely gone. Amen. So that's the difference between prayer and faith and not having faith. Ask for big things. I heard about another pastor in the south that uh, they were having a drought. And because of the drought, the pastor said, we need to have a special prayer meeting to pray about the drought. And he fixed the day and all these people came in the middle of the week to pray for the drought and no sooner had the service begun and the pastor said you're all dismissed and they looked at each other and said we said we're coming together to pray about the drought what do you mean we're dismissed we're here he said you're praying about the drought where are your umbrellas he said you didn't bring your umbrellas now he said that tongue-in-cheek I think they did pray but um, if you pray for something bring your umbrella show that you believe that God is going to answer your prayer Sometimes you may not feel like believing, but act out faith. And then, uh, you know, you, they say you fake it till you make it. God will bless you taking any steps of faith towards him. Let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. I remember reading in the Bible when Elijah, at the end of the famine, there was a terrible famine, you know, in Israel for three and a half years. And after this episode where the fire came down and burnt up the, the sacrifice and the prophets of Baal were slain, Elijah saw revival had begun. The people said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah tells Ahab, go up, for there's the sound of an abundance of rain. There wasn't a cloud in the sky when he said that. As a matter of fact, Elijah had not even prayed for the rain yet. But he told the king, you better take shelter. There's going to be an abundance of rain. And then Elijah goes up the mountain and he starts to pray and he continues to pray until a servant says, you know, I, I do actually see a little cloud coming out from the west about the size of a man's hand. I don't know what that means. I think that means he held his hand up and it was about that big. And then it got bigger and bigger until the sky grew black and there was a great rain. Before he saw a cloud in the sky, he told the king, you better take shelter. He had faith. That's why I think Elijah went to heaven without ever, ever dying. God wants us to believe in him. And you might think, well, how can I pray like that? God will help you. Paul promises in Romans 8, 26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, 
But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Now, let me just remind everybody, as I'm talking about prayer, some might be feeling inadequate, thinking I'm not being specific, I'm not being frequent, I'm not being faithful enough in my prayers. How many of you know that Jesus answers prayers we don't even pray? The Bible says he sends the sunshine and the rain on the just and the unjust. Jesus answers prayers for the atheists. He provides for people because he's a God of love. So don't think because I'm not doing it perfectly, God's not going to answer any prayers. The Spirit will take our mumbling and our groanings and it makes it eloquent before God and he'll tell us what to pray for or he'll fix it along the way. I like these new computer programs. I still haven't gotten over spell check. It's wonderful. As I'm typing, it's correcting. Now if a computer can do that, what can the Holy Spirit do when we pray with our prayers? Amen? And it ain't artificial intelligence. It's the original intelligence. Number five, pray earnestly. You know, do it from your heart. God wants our heart. Sometimes people, they pray, and you can tell their hearts aren't in it. And I've done that. You know, you, you pray and it's, you're going through the ritual of prayer. Do you think God is blessed by that? He wants to commune with our hearts. God wants our hearts. He said, my son, give me your heart. Your prayer should be from your heart. Think about what you're praying. And if you find yourself keep saying the same old thing every time, say, Lord, help me mix it up a little bit. Um, otherwise, it gets boring. You know, if you're married and you just say the same thing to everybody all the time, I try to surprise Karen every now and then in our commu communications with things that might be different and I invent new words of endearment and I stand back to see how she reacts. But it keeps it interesting, right? So, that's how it is with the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 13, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I don't want you to notice just the searching. Notice the heart. He wants us to search with all of our heart. Ecclesiastes, Solomon said in chapter 9, verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. And that would go for praying as well. Mean it when you pray. You're talking to God. That's, that's really profound when you think about it. Charles Spurgeon had an illustration. He said, uh, prayer pulls the rope down below and the great bell rings above in the ears of God. Some scarcely stir the bell. They pray so lazily, others only give it an occasional jerk. But he who communicates with heaven is a man who grasps the rope boldly and he pulls continually with all of his might. And I picture like the hunchback of Notre Dame where Quasimodo grabs the bell rope and he swings from it, making the bear cl bell clang above. And when you pray, get a hold of the rope and just launch off with it and make it ring in the ears of God. Amen? Do it with your heart. You know, God is not impressed with the length of our prayers. Jesus says a lot about the hypocrites praying long prayers. He is much more interested in the intensity and sincerity. A short, intense prayer does more than a long prayer without heart. A short prayer meant for God does a lot more than a long prayer trying to impress people. The Pharisees would pray long prayers that they may be seen of men. I timed it again last night because I had forgotten. When Elijah prayed and fire came down from heaven, how long do you think that prayer is? It's got the whole prayer right there. 17 seconds. And fire comes down from heaven and there's a revival. Well, he'd done a lot of praying before he got to that prayer, but he just prayed. He got us specifically right to the point that the people might know that the Lord was God. It says, Hear, O Lord, hear, O Lord. And he's praying about God's glory. The prophets of Baal prayed all day long and nothing happened. That happens in some churches too. God wants us to pray with heart, sincerity, consecration, earnestly. Praying without ceasing is not talking about public prayers. Ecclesiastes 5.2 Let your words be few when you enter into the house of God. Have you ever heard of a musician that was praised because they played so long? Or do they praise them because they play well? And so God wants us to pray from our hearts and be to the point. 
And, you know, I might add as a subcategory, this is not one of the numbers if you're counting, but pray persistently. That goes along with earnestly, doesn't it? Watch, therefore, and pray always that you might be counted worthy to escape these things that are going to come to pass. Jesus says that about the last days. Watch and pray always. Acts 1, these all continued in prayer. Acts 1, 14. Continued. Again, pray without ceasing. Acts 6, 34. We will give ourselves continually to prayer. Acts 10, 2. Cornelius prayed to God always. Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast in prayer. Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer. Now, are you getting the drift here? Prayer is not just something you schedule maybe three times a day and you should have regular times for prayer. But it's, it's a way of life. It's just breathing this atmosphere of heaven, walking with God, not forgetting His presence, talking to Him, throwing up just spontaneous prayers. Now you can pray when you're swimming. Peter did. He was drowning and said, Lord, save me. It was a short three-word prayer. It was very sincere. It was very heartfelt, wasn't it? And did God hear that prayer? He can pray swimming. Jehoshaphat prayed while he was being chased by an army of chariots. And he said it was even shorter than Peter's prayer. He said, Lord, help. Did God answer that prayer? Was it heartfelt? Yeah. So, how many of you have prayed driving before? <laughs> you lose control on the ice. And you call out to the Lord. He, he can hear those prayers. Nehemiah prayed while he was serving tables for the king. And God answered his prayer. Sometimes, you know, you just you need to pray where you're at. Having said that, being in an attitude of prayer all the time, there should be times of official prayer. And I'm not going to take a lot of time and talk about it, but I do want to say that uh, it is appropriate for those that are physically able in your prayers to kneel before God. Not always, but don't always neglect it. God has a lot to say about that. If you look, you can see where uh, Luke, Jesus knelt down and prayed. Acts 9, Peter put them out. He knelt down and prayed. Acts 20, 36, Paul knelt down and prayed. Daniel knelt upon his knees and prayed. David said, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before our God, the Maker. Everybody from the fisherman to King Solomon knelt and prayed. You're talking to the King of Kings, and your posture sometimes says something about submission. People bow before dignitaries. And uh, shall we not bow? Every knee someday is going to bow to God, right? Now, I know. If you, got, you, you get old and not only is it hard to get down, it's hard to get up. And God understands. He doesn't want you to torture yourself. But if you're young and healthy and I, I think there ought to be times every day in my life I kneel and pray. I kneel before God. I kneel in my office. I get to church. First thing I do is I go to the back room there. I kneel down. I pray. I'm talking to the king of the universe. And I recognize that I just can't kneel far enough to acknowledge how great he is. But the least I could do, I mean, even the alpha dogs makes the other dogs will lower their heads. Uh, if dogs recognize posture, what about people? So let's humble ourselves every day. You can pray all the time, but take some time to bow before your maker in prayer. Amen? That's just something I think is biblical that's being lost See, a lot of these evangelical churches are just shouting and bossing God around, standing, and like that proud Pharisee who stood and prayed thus with himself. The publican bowed his head and beat upon his chest. We should be humble in our prayers. I think that's one of the keys. Humble ourselves and do it persistently. And then also pray patiently. God always answers prayers of faith. He may not answer it as quickly as you ask. You know, and sometimes we lose patience, we get in trouble. Abraham prayed to be a father, but when it didn't happen as quickly as he and Sarah had hoped, they lost patience and took matters into their own hand. And that's why there's war in the Middle East right now. See how far-reaching impatience can go? So pray. Zachariah and Elizabeth also wanted a baby. 
And they thought it was hopeless. God said, I'm going to answer your prayers, but a little later than you expect. But I'm going to give you a really good baby, greatest prophet who's ever lived. Pray. Hannah also. And I keep talking about babies. There's a lot of things you can pray for. You need patience. There might be a spouse or the job or I don't know what it is. You may not get the answer right away. And when you all close your eyes for a minute, would you like to see an amazing miracle of prayer? You can open them now and look around. Not just the people of this building. This is an answer to prayer. This facility, this church, this is an answer to many, many prayers by many, many people for many, many years. Uh, we're enjoying this blessing now, but it took patience. It took persistence. And so, uh, you know, God wants us to mix the, the persistence with our faith. So pray patiently. Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. God told David, you're going to be king. But do you know how long David had to wait before he actually was on the throne? Years went by. Did God keep his word? He did. Why did he take so long? He didn't take long. It's just it seems like a long time for us because we're humans. For God, a day is a thousand years. He did it very quickly. But it may have been seven years. So God will answer your prayer as quickly as you need it answered. Because sometimes the slow answer is God's answer. You're developing patience and faith. And be careful when you pray for love. What God will do is he'll surround you with people that will challenge your love. If you pray for patience, he'll send you delay. If you pray for strong muscles, he gives you a weight to carry, right? It's just how it works. But you still need all those things, so keep praying. Psalm 37, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. So, you know, part of prayer is, is also listening to God. Um, wait on your knees. Sometimes when we pray, we're in such a hurry, we think, all right, I got through my list, I'm done, and we hop up. Prayer should be two-way communication. Spend some time on your knees and not only talk to the Lord, but just listen. The Holy Spirit may impress you with things, and sometimes I think my mind's wandering when I pray, and it is. Sometimes I think my mind's wandering, and then I realize the Holy Spirit is reminding me of things, and God is speaking to me. So listen to the Lord when you're, when you're on your knees. I remember hearing about the manager of this large opera house. Got a call one day in the office and this lady, a wealthy lady, had been to the opera that week and she said, I had a very expensive brooch. It was worth $10,000 and it fell off when I took off my jacket. I'm almost sure that it's there. He said, well, what area were you sitting in? She tried to describe it. He said, well, just hold the phone a minute. This is years ago and you, know, you just put the phone on pause. I says, I'll go look. Ten minutes later, he came back. He had found the brooch. He picked up the phone. She got tired of waiting. She hung up. Never left her name or number. He didn't know what to do with the brooch. Just got tired of waiting. I wonder how many times God is getting ready to do something wonderful in our devotions and we jump off our knees. So give the Lord a chance to speak to your heart when you're praying. Pray obediently. Now this is a controversial one. Do you know obedience is one of the keys in an answer to prayer? John 3, I'm sorry, 1 John 3, 22. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Pastor Doug, that sounds like you're saying, first of all, it's not me, right? It's God. Sounds like it's saying that if you obey me, I'll answer your prayers. Now, who feels worthy? This is a little tricky. Through prayer, we are able to obey, and obedience will augment your prayers. You can't obey God without prayer. Doesn't Jesus say, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation? That means you pray, he gives you strength to obey. Is that right? Okay, but there's a lot more God does for those that obey. 1 Kings 20, verse 2 through 6. Hezekiah, when he just got a terminal diagnosis from Isaiah that he was going to die, he turned his face toward the wall and he prayed to the Lord, said, Lord, remember, O Lord, I pray, 
how I have walked before you in truth with a loyal heart. I've done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him and said, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord God of David your father, I've heard your prayer, I've seen your tears, I will heal you. But I always thought he said, Lord, I've obeyed you. Now, you can't claim that all the time, but less than, you know this one. I'm going to read it another time. 2 Corinthians seven fourteen, If my people, how many of you know this, which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, listen, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So what is one of the keys to having answered prayer? Surrender to the Lord. Obey. 1 Timothy 2.8 I desire therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands. I've heard a lot of pastors use that to make a, a, an argument about how we have to all lift our hands when we pray. There's nothing technically wrong with it but that's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about the holiness. Your hands mean your work. It says when you pray that we pray with holy hands that our lives, our actions are consistent with our profession. James 5.16, the effect of fervent prayer, what's the rest of that? Of a righteous man avails much. Psalm 66.18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Proverbs 28, verse 9, one who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Now, God is good. I've told you, he answers the prayers of atheists. He's, he's merciful. And he answers prayers, but I think we have a lot of prayers that go unanswered because we are unsurrendered. And God could do so much more if we would really represent him, if we'd obey him and pray in faith. Say amen, please, because it's true. He wants us to be obedient, and I think that does something, as I mentioned, to augment our prayers. Number eight, we're almost there. I might go a minute long, but I'm, I'm going to try and finish this up. Pray proactively. What do I mean by that? Prayer should be accompanied with action. Ask, then act. Matthew 7, 7. You know, Jesus says, ask. What's the rest of that? You'll receive. What happens after you ask? He says, then I want you to... So you ask, say, Lord, I'm missing my keys. He says, okay. Seek. Knock. So the first thing is the asking, but that's followed up by you doing seeking and knocking. It's not enough for us to just pray and then you say, Lord, please give me a job and then we sit there on the computer and wait for the phone to ring. No. Pray and go out and knock on doors. Amen? God wants activity. There's a great quote in a book called Testimonies of the Church, Volume 4. Many never attain to the positions which they might occupy because they wait for God to do for them that which He's given them the power to do for themselves. All who are fitted for usefulness in this life must be trained by the severest mental and moral discipline and then God will assist them by combining divine power with human effort. We're waiting for God to do something that He'll help you when you, you draw near God. You take some steps, He will then draw near to you. The prodigal son started home. He got up and he started doing something. The father ran to meet him. God will bring His power and answers to you when you make a human effort to do what he's given you the ability to do. Amen? One time, King Jehoshaphat went out. I'm sorry, it was actually King Asa. He went out in battle against one million soldiers. It's the only time you're going to find a million in the Bible. The Ethiopian army had come against him. He had half the men. All his combined forces were about half that. And here's what he said. Lord, it is nothing with you to help whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on you and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let men prevail against you. You know what he did after he prayed? He went and he fought. And they won a resounding victory. So he prayed, but then he fought. David probably prayed before he went against Goliath, but then he went. Pray collectively. There's added power when we pray together. 
Jesus, Matthew 18, verse 19. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth, that means at least two, concerning anything they ask, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven. I believe that God will answer the prayer of one righteous man, woman, who prays in faith. And he can make fire come down or rain come down or whatever. But I believe there's added power when God's people come together to pray. When the Holy Spirit was poured out, they were gathered together in prayer. It's important for us to come together. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, you notice he says, my people, come together in prayer. In Acts 1.14, these all continued with one accord in prayer. So there's power in collective prayer. Pray together in your families. Pray together in, in groups. I hope we're all part of uh, groups and ministries where we can pray. And then finally, pray officially. What do you mean, Pastor Doug? Is it an unofficial prayer? Well, in order for your prayer to be official, you're praying in the name of Christ. There needs to be a signature on the check. The Bible says that we pray in His name. Amen? John 14, 13, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father might be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, coming in the name of the Lord doesn't mean like in the story of Arabian Nights when they went before the magic cave and they would say, open sesame, and then they'd have access to all the treasure. Some people think the utterance of the name Jesus is an open sesame to prayer. It's not magic in that way. Praying in the name of Jesus means that we pray with his mind, that we're praying in submission to him, that we're trusting in the merits of his power, his righteous life, his blood. Here's another great quote from a book called Steps to Christ, page 101. But to pray in the name of Jesus is something more than the mere mention of that name at the beginning and the ending of the prayer. It's to pray in the mind and the spirit of Jesus while believing his promises, relying on his grace, and doing his works. You know what it means to pray in the name of Jesus? He closes the Lord's Prayer with a commentary. You know, in the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The only comment that Jesus makes on the Lord's Prayer is he says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. What's the most important prayer we could pray? Forgive us. Lord, have mercy on us. The very foundation of prayer is, are we willing to have a forgiving heart towards others? That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name, to pray with the spirit and the mind of Christ, and then, of course, trusting in the power and the blood of Jesus, friends. Can you say amen? Praying in the name of the Lord. If you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has ought against thee, leave your gift before the altar and go your way. Be reconciled to your brother. Then come and pray your uh, prayer and offer your gift. You know, there's so much more. Every year, I think, we need to talk about prayer in our messages. It's foundational to the life and health of the church and our Christian experience. Again, I want to finish where I started. There is no limit to what God wants to do through this church in our lives. The limit is, are we asking? Are, are we available? Are we surrendered? He wants us to be channels of blessing to the world. He says, all power is given to me. And if we humble ourselves before him, he wants to release that power in our lives. Let's ask him. When it says ask, do you know that is a verb in Greek? It doesn't mean once, it means continually asking. A life of asking. Daily bread. How often? Every day. We need to be asking the Lord and praying. I want to be able to walk with God. Don't you, friends? Yeah. Be aware of his presence. We're going to sing about it. We need him every hour. And so I'd like to have our singers come out and lead us. Why don't we stand together? Did I give you the right? No, I come to the garden alone. That's the hymn.
I'd like to hear you sing the last verse. Let's put the next verse up. I'd like to hear the say, last verse and a cappella because I want it to feel more like a prayer. We'll have them lead us to make sure we're on key, okay? I'd stay like to have a revival in their prayer life and we'll just say Lord teach us to pray Father in heaven especially for us living at the end of time we need to know what it means to pray as you taught your disciples and Lord I pray that uh, we can just have a relationship with you where we we walk with you not only regular times of formal prayer personal times of prayer corporate times of prayer but just to live in your presence, to know what it means where you said you are with us wherever we go and we are sending up spontaneous prayers all through the day. Lord, help us to live our lives in a way that we can experience these keys to answered prayer. Many of us have important prayers in our life for personal needs, prayers for others. We pray that you'll work miracles and strengthen our faith and answer these prayers, Lord. Bless this church that we might be a praying church, that we might be ready to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We thank you. We ask all these things and many that are not yet spoken because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Hi friends, the program you just watched was recorded at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church where I serve as lead pastor. We'd love to meet you. If you're ever in the Sacramento area, come and worship the Lord with us. We'll meet you in the lobby and shake your hand. 